I think that audiences, as people, are, are brilliant. We are smarter than we know we are. The world becomes a lot more thematic because the sky, instead of being, instead of being, instead of the, still my landscape that, I'm, that my characters are moving through, being something flat that got laid down on the planet Earth with the whole of the open sky. You know, it's like you're in a room suddenly, there's a lid on everything. So then the city becomes less of a flat plane, then it becomes like a three-dimensional machine that you're moving through. And, and uh, kind of like a rat inside of a three-dimensional machine. That was the metaphor about Thief. And that's why I shot as much at night time as I could, so that you felt that Frank was like this. He moved through the city as if the city was a three-dimensional construction. There's these people, they're dimensional from my own experience with with um, you know, with convicts, with, with professional thieves. They're people, they have families, they have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and the, uh, and so it was the, the appeal of really digging into the dimensional life of all the characters um, and, and their outcomes that was uh, fascinating. Empathetic connection, subjective, I am him. I know what he's thinking. He just went like this. I, could, I know what's in his mind. And that's, what, that's, what, that's the ambition. Welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. Do you like night driving, intense dialogue scenes set in diners, or beautiful close-up hand-to-hand combat fight choreography? Then Michael Mann might just be the filmmaker for you. So my name's John, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Alt. How's it going, everybody? How's it going, Jason? Uh, we're finally talking Michael Mann. This is your, this is your guy. This is my guy. This is and not guy. a guy who I thought was my guy until I looked into it. Oh, all right. Uh, and uh, we have a special guest uh, today on the cast, not made of barley and hops, but filmmakers might know uh, this gentleman from things like Team Action, uh, the Action Guys podcast, the Movie Trivia Schmodown. We have Ben the Boss Bateman. Thank you for joining <laughs> us, sir. What's going on? I didn't realize that I'm Ben the Boss Bateman in, in, in myself when I'm like on shows. I thought that was only one place, but I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm really excited that you guys are talking to Michael Mann. At one time in my life, this guy was... Uh, Jason, this was this was my guy too. He was I, I, I rep for like five years that he was my favorite director working. Um, obviously, you know times change, but the period then he of made his black career, cat. I get it. Yeah, the period of his career that I'm the most fond of is like some of the most masterclass filmmaking ever. So it's it's I'm excited to talk about him today. I, I am admittedly not uh, as much into this genre of filmmaking. So before, I mean, this is why this kind of show is so great. I I didn't watch a lot of man films into until doing the research on this show but man i mean he's Is i that mean pun intended uh, it, was an pun. it was it yeah. was uh but yeah i mean he's up there as far as crime noir films go i mean he's just as good as like a david fincher and, uh, and i'm glad that i kind of dive deep into this so uh before we kind of jump in let's set the stage i'm gonna just kind of run down his filmography so you know if anyone hasn't seen Michael Mann films or doesn't know exactly what he has produced uh, or directed, I will kind of run that down right now. So uh, Mann starts his career in the director's chair in 1981 with the neo-noir crime film Thief starring James Kahn. This film would have an original musical score composed and performed by German electro ambient band Tangerine Dream. Next up would be the filmmaker's only foray into the horror genre with 1983's The Keep based on F. Paul Wilson's novel of the same name. This film would be followed up with 1980 is crime thriller Manhunter based on the novel Red Dragon. This was his uh, the first film to adapt a story in the Hannibal Lecter novel series. Uh, Man would take a break from directing for eight years until filming the epic historical drama 1992's The Last of the Mohicans, starring Daniel Day-Lewis not drinking a milkshake. Uh, in 1995, uh, 1995, Man decides to remake an unproduced television series, which was released as a TV movie, L.A. Takedown. The remake, Heat, starring Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, would become one of Michael Mann's most critically and commercially successful films. He would follow up Heat's success by bringing back Pacino once again for American drama film The Insider in 1999 about a tobacco scientist exec taking down big tobacco. 
Mann would shift over and direct the sports biopic Ali in 2001, starring Will Smith in the titular role of Muhammad Ali. Although Smith would earn a Best Actor nomination, the film was not considered a commercial success. Uh, in 2004, Mann would return to his neo-noir crime drama roots with Collateral, although familiar territory he would go against the grain and cast Tom Cruise in an anti uh, anti antagonistic, I could speak, uh, role. Jamie Foxx would earn a Best Supporting Actor nomination for his role as uh, the Cabbie Max. In 2006, Mann would try and strike lightning in a bottle twice by remaking the popular TV series Miami Vice with Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx. The film was polarizing both at the box office and with critics. 2009 saw Mann direct Public Enemies, a biographical mob drama centered around the final years of notorious bank robber John Dillinger, played by Johnny Depp, and would take a six-year break and return to direct uh, Black Hat in 2015, an action techno thriller. Mann would be inspired to make the film after reading about the events surrounding Stuxnet, a computer worm targeting Iran's nuclear centrifuges. And finally, Mann is currently working on biopic Enzo Ferrari, starring Christian Bale, which should be released in, uh, released in 2019. So out of all those films, I mean, that's that's quite a catalog, although he does have a, a set style. What are some of those uh, that, that really stick out to you guys as far as uh, like a quintessential Michael Mann film? Well, I think um, I'll jump in first if you don't mind here, Jason. Yeah, go to town. The, the thing that's important to remember about Michael Mann is that um, – he had a significant portion of his career in the eighties that was devoted to television. Um, so crime story was a very successful show that he was a big part of. And the series Miami vice, he did mention that's kind of what actually made Michael Mann famous. I mean, My Miami vice, there's a very famous shot in the pilot of Miami vice where they play the entirety of the song in the air tonight or in the air of the night, whatever something, the, the Phil Collins song. Um, and it's in, the, it's in the pilot episode and it's, it's kind of, like vintage Michael Mann because it's so long and it's so atmospheric uh, and it became kind of a staple of what he would do later in his career. But I think it's important to remember that he had a lot of success, success in crime-based episodic. Um, he even actually, you mentioned uh, his first film was Thief. 1979 saw him do a film called The Jericho Mile, which is a mm -hmm. TV movie that he directed. It's really good actually. And so he, that, all that stuff later, he was much more polished, like the really famous stuff, but there's such a big part of his career that's not just in film school. You can see it. You can see it in, in hour long weekly shows that he did for most of the eighties. Jericho mile really was his film school. He shot that on location in Folsom, uh, talked to a lot of prisoners, prison guards, the warden had to make a, like he said, they was worried. They said if there was like a riot, a race riot or anything, they'd have to suspend shooting. They're like, yeah, if someone gets murdered, no big deal. But if there's a race riot, so they had to, you know, navigate the, the inner jail politics to make sure nothing went down while they were trying to film. So I would, yeah. I would say that was basically his film school. He, he says he learned a lot more doing that than he did anything else. So I believe, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the story that I got told this was, but I interviewed Danny Trejo a year or two ago. And Ooh. when I, when I met him, um, I mentioned the character Johnny 23, which is the character that he plays in Con Air. And he told me that he got that name in that movie because Michael Mann, I believe had met his dad in Folsom while filming the Jericho mile. He was surprised that I'd ever heard of the Jericho mile. And that his dad's nickname in prison was Johnny 23. I don't think for the same reason, but that was the nickname. And I think I could be speaking out of turn here. He might've told me it's, there's an actual interview you can find of this. At the, it's at the hell or high water premiere. But I think that he, that's what he said is that that was a nickname of his dad or his uncle or something. And that's what Danny Trejo's name in Con Air is, is from the Jericho mile. That's awesome. Yeah, and Folsom Prison would be kind of a re reoccurring character in his films as well. That definitely left a lasting impact on, on him as a filmmaker. Uh, that experience, that early experience, as, as you know, stuff early on in your career tends to do. But he would he would reference Folsom Prison quite a bit later definitely. on. Yeah. Well, so, Arch go oh, go ahead, Ben. No, 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 no please, man. I'm the guest here. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say architecture as a character is a recurring theme in his in his films. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so to answer your question, then, uh, you know, if there's a Michael Mann film of that catalog that stands out, the answer to the question for me, it, it comes down to just two. And and ultimately, when I've gone back to watch all the movies again, weirdly enough, as much as I love Heat, because it is my favorite Michael Mann movie, The Insider is the movie. That's the one. It, I, and I don't really know why, because I don't like it as much as I like Heat, but it's the movie that to me feels the most like the correct version of what Michael Mann is good at doing. Incredibly intense people talking in rooms that he likes to do. 
he likes to use that as a set piece between his action scenes. Um, you realize that the action in Heat, which is incredible, obviously, it's the greatest shootout in the history of film, as good as it is, he's able to accomplish a lot of the same intensity without that in The Insider. And I think pacing-wise, it's his best movie. It's the one that has the least fat. Because I do think that Heat and Collateral, which are my other two favorites, both have uh, 20-ish minutes that are not as good as they should be. Uh, he said himself there, was there anything you would cut from Heat? He was like, yeah, the whole scene with the uh, the guy when Pacino comes home, he's like, you can't watch my television. Yeah, he said yeah, he would have yeah. cut all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rough. I would argue taking out the Natalie Portman arc as well uh, out of Heat. Well, that was a bummer, but I think it sh- kind of showed that they both left Devastation in their wake. Both Pacino and De Niro sort of messed up everybody's lives around them. Yeah, I also, there's a part of me that likes that he... Um... So part of me that likes that he like cares so much about her, you know, it shows a side of his character that I think is interesting. You guys know the story about heat, right? That, that you never hear this. I'm sure Jason, you've probably done the research on this, but Pacino played the character as though he would rail a bunch of Coke and go out mm-hmm. and, fight and, and hunt criminals all night. And they never show it in the movie. It's not a thing that ever happens. So you just think that he's like, she's got a great ass. He's like doing his yeah. thing. But like, that actually he's just supposed to be super coked out, which makes way more sense for that performance. Why, why did they omit that from, from the actual storyline? They just wanted to humanize him a little bit more, make him think, more likable? I don't think he. I don't think it was in the script. I think Pacino wrote that into his own character notes. Mm. You don't need yeah. to see it. That's just how I'm going to play this character. That's Pacino in every role, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most part. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, the Insider was just intense. It was... It, 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 that movie is a little bit long, but but I enjoyed every minute of it. It's like a, it's almost like a, like we referenced Jason the other uh, episode. It's kind of like a Zodiac or like a Zero Dark Thirty a little bit, where it's just that about that obsession. Um, but but you got two two different uh, POVs in, in this one, where it's with Russell Crowe and with Al Pacino's character, uh, with just like prestige and everything on the line. Uh, I, I I loved the Insider. I think, in my opinion, Manhunter wound up being one of my favorite movies, if Great not movie. my favorite man uh, movie out of the bunch. I think if you saw it recently for the first time, I think anybody who saw Manhunter after they saw Red Dragon was delighted about how good it was and a little surprised that it sort of went unheralded. I think it was overshadowed by Demi's fantastic Silence of the Lambs. So everyone kind of forgets that the first time Hannibal Lecter was ever on screen was in Manhunter. And if I remember correctly, my boy Brian Cox plays Hannibal Lecter, no? Yep, that was Brian Cox. He was so fantastic in that role. He was Such really a big good. Brian Cox fan. You know, we have a segment on one of my shows called Just Add Cox, that every movie is made better when you add Brian Cox. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you would have told me a, a movie with, uh, you know, the guy from CSI, uh chris elliott in this movie albeit yeah. a very small role but just seeing chris elliott was like kind of jarring for me uh and brian cox's hannibal lecter instead of you know the preconceived notion of, of who you think is the embodiment of the character uh, and it just it just floored me it blew me away i thought uh I, i'm blanking on on the guy's name that played will but yeah, i thought he did a just, great I'm job literally racking my brain it's i think it's william peterson um, yeah and he, uh, he I have had IMDb a, open. I'm not doing my job here. <laughs> he had a pretty, he had a pretty quick arc. That guy. He did that film. Another movie within two years of it called To Live and Die in L.A., which was a later Friedkin film after Friedkin had really had his, you know, his '70s heyday. Uh, and that's a great movie. Um, <laughs> the theme song done by Wang Chung, by the way. Um, and uh, he's 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 really good in that movie, Willie, Willie Peterson. And and Manhunter, it did go unheralded because if you think about the movies that Man had done prior to that it doesn't surprise you. The keep is unwatchable. I mean, thief's yeah. really good, but thief, nobody saw thief. Like he wasn't a somebody yet. So he hadn't done Mohicans. He hadn't really become that thing. And so I think Manhunter is really good. It's also good because your expectation is pretty, is pretty uh, modest going into watching that movie. Yeah. Peterson sort of just petered out, did a lot of TV. Yeah. Well, I mean, he does a lot of TV was... now, but like, yeah, he was sort of yeah. didn't do much feature film after this. Jason kind of, Missed his moment. He, he could have been uh, could have been Don Johnson, but he wasn't. Jason, we talk a lot about uh, film, like first efforts for for the filmmakers. And yes, Jericho Mile is technically the the first one, but as far as a feature film goes, Thief is kind of the, the first one, at least that he gets credited for uh, as being like the first feature. 
I thought that this was, out of all the shows that we've done so far, this was probably the best first effort. Thief was a masterpiece. I think James Caan is very underrated in that kind of, I mean, he should be held in as high of esteem as like a Pacino and a De Niro in those type of roles. His classic run was really impressive. Yeah, I think the the thing about Thief that I found as in terms of as a first effort most impressive was he seemed to know who he was as a director. Yeah. Like he hit all the tropes you see later. He had all of that stuff. It seemed like he figured out exactly the movie he wanted to make. And then he made a lot of versions of Thief afterward. But it, in terms of knowing what you want and what you want to do and the shots you like and all that kind of stuff, he established a lot of that in his first effort, which is it's pretty crazy to me. Stop me if you've already had this discussion, but it's the idea that a director... His movies and the characters specifically in his movies reflect a lot of the style as a person that you see from that director. So on the Action Guys, we just did a Fincher versus Nolan episode. We talked a lot about how Christopher Nolan's characters are always these kind of British-inspired guys in really, really well-tailored suits. They're always like kind of interesting and heady. They're super intelligent. They're international guys, right? Very big scope of the way that they, they present themselves. You look at Nolan. He's a guy always in a scarf and an overcoat, hair slicked back. You know, that's who he is, right? You look at Fincher, so he's got in the pictures, he's got a, a unshaven a hat, he's got the headphones around his neck, very technical. His characters tend to be kind of grimier. They're like they they don't they're not as afraid to get their hands dirty. They live in dirtier cities, a movie like Seven. Like that's kind of who they are. So you think about Michael Mann, he's a guy who's incredibly meticulous in his shot selection. He's incredibly detailed in the characters that he builds. That's that's his that's him, that's his movies, that's the way he's done it his whole life. So the idea that these thieves in his movies are these perfectly articulated, incredibly well prepared, never make a mistake, live by a code guys, you know, Neil McCauley with the crisp white shirt and the suit, that's kind of who man thinks he is, probably. It's how he feels he makes his movies, is the way that Neil McCauley would do a, a robbery, right? Years you take years to prepare. He's definitely not. I mean, he, he's very put together, like watching interviews of him. Uh, he is, you know, he's always got he's always just physically talking uh, and, and his mannerisms and his demeanor. But he does have a little bit of that sleaze, too, about him. And, and I mean this in a in a in a good way, I guess, where you wouldn't be surprised seeing him walk out of a foot massage uh, place. You know? <laughs> but he but that's that is like to your point, that's kind of the embodiment of his movies where they are very classy. They are very they're shot. Uh, immaculately, but there is that that tinge of, of cheese and and a little bit of sleaze in there as well. Definitely, well, one hundred percent. I mean, and there's he's a very old school Chicago guy. You know, when you listen to him talk, he's got that he's got that real thick Chicago accent, and he's, I mean, Chicago kind of is that city. He is he is a Chicago guy to his core. Um, so I always thought I always find that really interesting. You can see so much of those directors in the presentation of their films and their characters, like the way they they present themselves to the world when you see them. In an interview, how do they dress? You know, what words do they use? Yeah. And, and I think you'll, for that to hold true, you go back to first efforts. You look at a movie like Following and uh, talk yeah. about Christopher Nolan embodied in those characters. Yeah, definitely. Right. They, they're still, it's kind of, it's kind of that same thing. It's these, it's these really well put together characters that have this kind of dark side. Um, yeah. Uh, and Jason, you had like a bunch of notes about the kind of of main, you know, antagonists or and protagonists, which kind of they're never completely likable and they're never completely like uh, panned as far as the he, end. He he blurs the lines, which is why you can show a, a movie like Heat, which is from you know you're rooting for the antagonist almost kind of, and a movie like Miami Vice where you're rooting for the cops. And they're presented the exact same way, dispassionately. He's not making any value judgments. And I think he likes morally ambiguous characters to the point where he likes to dress everybody in that morally ambiguous gray suit for a character yeah. like Neil or Vincent in Collateral. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Love I love yeah, I love that you pointed that out too because I didn't even notice that they're essentially wearing the same outfit. It looks like, it, and I think I mentioned off air, Jason, where it's like, is that kind of character at least in, in that embodiment of a character like Man's Randall Flag, you know, for a kind of a Stephen King reference? It, it just seems like that style of antagonist, that kind of inevitability, but uh, you know, scary, but still has kind of a heart to him, or at least a, a softer side. That seems to intrigue uh, Man quite a bit. I, th I think he doesn't like one dimensional characters and I, you watched black hat recently and I told you to think about yeah. the, the gray suit when you watch black hat 
And uh, the the character in that movie wore nothing but bright pastel colors, all white. I'm the white hat. I'm fighting the black hat. He was more of a one dimensional character. And um, like he was in jail for hacking. He wasn't a bad guy. He he never like roughed up a woman like James Conn did in Thief or, you right. know, uh, he was he's so unambiguous that I I feel like that's one of the reasons that movie wasn't as well received. I don't think the character was that interesting because it wasn't the kind of character that man typically writes. Yeah, he, he was uh, completely that, that movie's kind of a mess. Um, and, and see, watching these films and, and I either rewatched them all or watched them for the first time uh, in chronological order, as I tend to do when I'm researching this, this was the kind of complete opposite of, of doing this show on Catherine Bigelow, where Catherine Bigelow, yes, some of her early movies like Blue Steel and everything, they were kind of amateurish but then you got to see the the steep incline of finding out who she was as a filmmaker and then just Catherine Bigelow right now is on fire uh where now it shows like you know in my opinion collateral was the last greatest Mike uh, last great Michael Mann film and it makes me a little bit worried that he's kind of he relies more on this like you know shooting in this weird like super 35 uh the the Thompson Viper film stream where it just looks like almost too realistic, where it just looks fake. I, I don't know. Um, it, it uh, he looks- he wanted that. He he said specifically in Public Enemies, shooting in that hyper realistic manner kind of made it almost like an uncanny valley thing, where it looked otherworldly or it, it looked like you know glitzy. Uh, that was an effect he wanted, but I didn't like it. I mean, he's so he's definitely a guy who. Correct me if I'm wrong here. If you've got time to be open, I think Michael Mann's like 72. It was in that range. Is that right? He's he's like early to mid 70s, I think. Uh, he was born in 43, so yeah, yeah. So 03, he was 60. 13, he was 70. Yeah, yeah. So he's 75 years old. So mm-hmm. it's not that surprising that his because I when we opened the show, I said you know like the, the period of of Mann's career that goes from about. I've watched most of Miami Vice, some of Crime Story. I'd say it goes from about 81 to about 04. And you could really say that if you if you don't want to be too precious about it, because that 80 stuff is good, but it's not as good as the really good stuff. You could really say that it goes from heat to collateral. It's basically those movies. That's that's the that's the really, really like masterful. Three of his four movies he makes there are like all timers to me. Um, the only kind of bad one is Ali. Um you can sort of see that that's where he hit his stride. He he was working with the best actors in the world. He was competent. He was the right age. He had the budgets. Hollywood worked differently then. You know, the difference between Michael Mann making Black Hat now and making Black Hat in 1995 is that he would have gotten a huge budget and it would have been a big studio push to make that movie a hit. They don't do that anymore. They, those those mid-level movies, the the like the like 25 to 85 million dollar drama doesn't exist anymore unless it's like once in a blue moon. Those movies miss back to like you go back to like the social network. And they got like almost 50 for that. That's like the last kind of movie of its type. Um, they just don't happen anymore. And so that's he's not really a director who is going to direct Green Lantern. He's a director who's going to keep directing the kind of movies he wants to direct. And it's going to mean that he's not going to have as much support. And at his age as well, I think you can kind of assume that the best parts of his career have happened. I just think that we're going to look back in 30 years and realize that there was almost not a finer crime director that's ever lived than Michael Mann because he's in the top three or five crime films ever made, arguably. And, and there's something to be said about that, too, because I, I was watching again, I was watching like the after watching Black Hat uh, an interview about it, and he is like literally geeking out about the subject matter. He was really passionate about it. And like you said, it's not like he's just going to direct, a, you know, the next DCEU film because of of money. He's a 75 year old elderly gentleman at this point. So he's going to make the things that he that that matter to him, whether it matters to the audience or not. And and that's good. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens with Enzo Ferrari. Um, I'm not do I care about the origin of Enzo Ferrari personally? Probably not, but will I see it because it's now a Michael Mann film? Okay. But I'm not expecting collateral again. Uh, so, you can yeah. expect Ali probably. That's the Maybe. only one I watch on this film list. Ali's like got like, Ali has like about 22 minutes of, of movie that's worth watching. And then the rest of it is just like that slowness. You talked about the insider. 
Yeah. It's just a lot less interesting. I mean, nice. it's funny. Yeah, I mentioned this to the insider and, and tell me if you guys can relate to this because I feel like this is a good director to talk about this with. So I have this concept for a show that I want to pitch somewhere and it's called uh, Movies About People Talking in Rooms. And the idea is that you have this genre of movie that I absolutely love. And if you're a Michael Mann fan, you probably love it as well, which is every, everything from like the Social Network, A Few Good Men, Spotlight, All the President's Men, Michael Clayton, like... Right. It's movies where like, you know, the verdict, it's kind of the courtroom drama, thriller, espionage type of deal. Um, and they're they tend to be the biggest plot points or like the documents are public or like, you know what I mean? Like or or <laughs> like, you know, they he, he, like, he, like he came in with a subpoena or something like that. You're like, oh, my God, everything changes now. And yeah, it's like just like, primal fear and stuff. Yeah. Some old white guy in a suit talking to another old white guy in a suit. And that's like literally what defines the movie. Um, but they're just really compelling for whatever reason. And I kind of think that the insider is the closest to that that he ever made. And it is kind of that, like the best scene in the insider is uh, what's his name? Bruce McGill yelling in the courtroom, but we got rights. We got lefts. It's just that it's just a courtroom scene of one lawyer yelling at another lawyer. That's and the that was lawyer. their gunfight. Say what? That was their gunfight. Totally. Yeah, you know. Totally. And it's, I think it's amazing that there's some directors that have some, some knack for taking material like that and making it really exciting. They, they, they find the moral ambiguity in people talking about things with huge stakes and they make it feel relatable to you because it sounds and feels and looks smart. I think Michael Mann make, is one of the best. He, he can make one bullet sitting in a mailbox feel as important as somebody firing off a whole round at, at a cop. It's exactly. just the, the, the threats in that movie. He does threats well. He's been, you know, doing real good threat scenes since Thief. So, and it's also kind of why I say, like, The Insider is, is the one that I appreciate more than Heat because Heat yeah. largely... If you think about Heat without the gunfight, or if the gunfight was not executed as well, then that movie goes from being like one of the three to five. Very good, memorable, good movie. Doesn't have like that thing that just elevates it to like way beyond the rest. See, he still does downtime so well, though. Like the the, the quintessential Heat moment, when I think of Heat, and most people, like you said, think of the, the shootout at the bank. But I think of the first kind of face to face you get with De Niro and Pacino sitting across from each other in a diner. Um, Man does does downtime stunningly, uh, e even in, in crap films, in my opinion, like Miami Vice, where it's just people driving around. Uh, he does it very stylistically. That's why he likes to shoot at night more. Uh, in an interview, he said it's like uh, he prefers shooting at night because it's like putting a cap on uh, on like a pressure cooker. Uh, yeah. And you, you just get to to paint with more of the color palette that way. You know, you get lights and neon and and uh, the reflections off the car while you're driving on the freeway, um, which conversely, probably his darkest film, Manhunter, is the brightest film. It's a very white, stringent looking film because it's all in hospitals and white jail cells. Uh, so that's a nice little dichotomy. But yeah, it, uh, he does downtime better than than most directors where a lot of other directors like like someone like a Bigelow kind of flounders in, in that you know shooting what when the action when the explosions aren't going off what are you going to look at how do you keep it interesting well Michael Mann knows exactly that he's, he's kind of fluent in that yep I agree I agree let's talk about a little bit more of just like his style choices like I mentioned that he does shoot uh you know he, he tends to like the nighttime a little bit more uh but he always has kind of a, a clubbing scene he always has uh, the, those scenes of, it, it's funny, there, there's like a YouTube super cut that I just happened to kind of stumble upon. And it's like the filmmaking of, of Michael Mann. I'm like, oh, is this, uh, is this like an interview or something? But it was actually just a super cut of scenes of almost every one of his movies. Uh, and, and they do have kind of same beats and same notes, but they, they work very well. You're never guessing, like a Fincher, you're never guessing if you're watching a Michael Mann film. Well, he talks a lot about, um, he talks a lot about that he's going to make the Heat prequel. He's been he's been talking about it for a long time now. Um, I saw a screening last year of Heat at the um, Westwood Village Regency, um, which is the big LA. It, the, it wasn't the 25th anniversary because it's the wrong. I don't exactly know what it was, but it was an anniversary screening of Heat. It was in the big theater, and it was with Michael Mann in attendance, and he did a Q and A with us afterwards. Um, and I got to you know listen to some some questions, and and unfortunately. The people in the audience were morons and people were trying to pitch him movies during the interview. So I didn't get to ask my question. Gross. And I've never gotten an interview, Michael Mann. I've always wanted to. You know, he's high on my list of guys that I wanted to talk to. But the question I was going to ask was that the final shot of Heat, I'm sorry, the final shot of Collateral is the opening shot of Heat, right? So it's the, the train pulls into the station 
and it's the same train that pulls out of the out of near the hospital when Neil is stealing the uh, ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same moment, it's the same city, and he knows this. It's intentional. But the diff, you know, there was ten years between the movies. So I wanted to ask him in the time that you started shooting LA to the time that you're shooting it now, do you notice a massive difference in the city? Do you feel that the city it looks different, is different to shoot for you? And I think it's interesting to note, right? Because there's not that many directors that that they they feel like their films all have some cohesive connection. Like he does have those similar characters, those and so much so that two unrelated movies have the same location and are sort of supposed to be taking place in the same universe, even. Um, he's interested in that sort of thing. And so I think in terms of style, you can define a lot of Michael Mann's style but by just walking around LA at night. It feels like a Michael Mann movie in a lot of cases, even if he's shooting in Miami. It doesn't really matter. It's just like he likes that big city at night thing, which is funny because it comes from Chicago, but it's become LA. Well, a lot of people make the mistake and think Thief was shot in LA just because he does such a good job of picking locations that are unique to that city, but also just sort of ambiguous. You feel like the city's just a character called the city. Yeah, Which totally. is why people can, yeah, like Miami at night and LA at night and Chicago at night sort of blend together a little bit. The Especially city. the way, yeah. Well, the way he likes to shoot people in their cars up close to the point where the background is just a blur, he, yep. you know, intentionally, he loves that effect. So um, I, I think it's it's interesting that architecture is such a character in his movies, but it almost doesn't matter what city it's in. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a steel and concrete, you know, it's the bright lights, it's that grainy feeling that you get at night in collateral. That That's the cornerstone of, of what a Michael Mann movie looks like. But I mean, gr growing up near LA, I know you're in LA now, Ben. It's just like he he takes that feeling of just literally walking around that city, and he he understands. Yes, it's it's kind of uh, the city is just the city, as you said. But he does have a really good grasp on shooting what matters to make it point out. Like he he has the uh, he's always taking a look at the uh, the Capitol building or not the Capitol building. I, I came uh, the yeah the Capitol Records building. Uh, he features that whenever he's doing LA uh, quite a bit. And the style of filmmaking, it's always that walking around, you know, kind of not shaky cam, but you know, like a steady cam. Yeah. Uh, where where you feel like you're you're walking around the city with him. Uh, where it's, it's almost so real like it's it's bizarre because i i've i've walked these streets you know in la at night uh when i was younger and it and it felt like he captured like i i could smell it like i could smell the atmosphere i could feel the atmosphere i i knew what what certain places sounded like and i feel like he captured that better than than watching like the revenant where you know everyone says when you go see the revenant in the, in the theater you felt you feel cold and it's very atmospheric um but you know i've never been to a, a place like that when he's walking around in la or something I've been to those places and I felt like I was actually there. Yeah, completely, completely agree with you. I, th I think he's one of the directors that handles atmosphere better than almost anyone. I defied to hear him talk about it. And the more he talked about it, the more I felt like every small detail was deliberate. Very much so. He's, he is that guy to a T. And the, the guys I know that have worked with Michael Mann, uh, a friend of mine has been an AD on a couple of his movies. I know some actors that have had smaller parts in his movies. He is... <laughs> A giant pain in the ass because he wants <laughs> people to stay late to finish the shot. You hear it about Cameron. You hear it about Nolan. They're assholes because they're like, if it's not exactly the way I want it, it's not right. But they're creatively, they're geniuses. So they're doing it right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why he loved Tom Cruise so much. He said that Tom was always the, you know, the first one in, last one out type deal. And he said Jamie Foxx is that way as well. Um, I, I know he traveled to like New Zealand or something to go audition it was basically an audition for chris hemsworth yeah. uh hemsworth w was out somewhere vacationing with his family and michael mann like stayed with him for two days on hemsworth's vacation just trying to get to know him and yeah uh, i guess it was a good a, a good visit because it worked out for him but yeah mm. it's yeah he is he is that kind of that nudge you know to use a, a jewish term he is he's that kind of you know poking poking you until you get it right or or just extreme high expectations, uh, complete perfectionist, which a lot of people would probably not like. You know, th there's a lot of uh, uh, actors that have worked with certain filmmakers, like a, like a Fincher. I think Mark Ruffalo went on the record, or uh, no, uh, it was Downey. It was Robert Downey Jr. went on the record saying that, you know, that that scene in Zodiac where they were sitting there in in, in the diner, uh, yeah, 
uh, he made him do it, what, like 77 times? 77 oh, yeah. times. And he it was just driving him nuts. And it seems like yep. Michael Mann would be that type of person. Totally. Yeah, I mean, the meticulous ones tend to be the best ones. It's un unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. But that, that lends to, I think Michael Mann is an extremely realistic uh, director where everything, you know, like we said, you know, he, he nails like walking around as much as his characters make decisions that real pe people make. Uh, they talk like his dialogue is people talking like real people talk. Uh, and that's that's hard to do. It never seems like movie lines, except in Black Hat. But <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's also like the, I mean, we're, we're singing all his praises. There's also the side of Michael Mann that is he has that idea of coolness. What is cool? Right. Michael, My, Miami Vice basically is the coolest TV show ever in the sense that it like it defined what cool looked like in a time, in a period. Like that was what the coolest guy could possibly look like in the coolest situation. So that famous shot in the first episode where he's driving, he's driving in the Ferrari or whatever it is. There's like a wheel well shot and they pull over and he like gets on the phone. And he calls in his a, wife. In a phone booth. In a phone booth, right? <laughs> yeah. and, she, and she's like, hello? He's like, I don't remember her name. It's just like, Victoria, was it real? You know, and you're like, you know, it's like really over the top. It's like so syrupy and so heavy handed. But to him at the time, he's like, this is the coolest thing in the world. Like there's nothing cooler than this. And it works. And then other times it doesn't work, which is the movie Miami Vice. Like just, you know, he like, made it in his late sixties and he's still like, I know what's rad. I, you know, <laughs> I know it's cool. I'm the I coolest mean, guy ever. Neil yeah. McCauley, and, and there's, yeah, I mean, a lot of Heat, those characters are really, really cool. I mean, Chris Jarrellis, he's an awesome, awesomely cool character. Um, Sarian Hines is the only one that I could stomach in that film. Call, looking at Colin Farrell made me physically ill in that, in that movie. There's some funny stories about that movie. That movie's pretty notorious for, like, there was, like, crazy stuff. Like, like they, they filmed in very dangerous areas. There was explosions. Jamie Foxx wouldn't go back to locations to finish filming, so they had to rewrite it, change the plots so they could finish the movie. Colin Farrell apparently was before rehab, he was way off the deep end, like just super like uh, full, full of all kinds of drugs and alcohol. <laughs> the movie is like, a, like the story is pretty much a just disaster. This is the chubbiest Colin Farrell. I think I've ever seen too on, on camera. Miami vice. Uh, yeah. He just little... looked nasty. I don't know. He just like, with, and it didn't help that he was yeah. shooting on that super high def camera too. Cause you could see every bit of grease dripping off that hair. I was, yeah, it was just, there was no enjoyment at all. Like even the, the violence and it was just so over the top, like the, the uh, shooting in the car and like yeah. the hands popping off. It just looked ridiculous. And I'm and expecting, you know, the with the highest a little over the top though, but in a fun campy way, well, they I blow up a helicopter with a rocket launcher and you're like, this is television. <laughs> 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 this is 8 PM on CBS. You sure? Yeah. Cause like, cause like there's also, I mean, if you like, I think you can learn about everything you need to know about Miami vice by watching the trailer from Miami Vice. It's one of the most of its time trailers I've ever seen. It plays the the, the mashup of uh, of Numb Encore, the Linkin Park Jay-Z song from 2006. <laughs> it like it starts out with like Colin Farrell standing on a cell phone next to Jamie Foxx, and he's like, do you know the definition of the word foreboding? It means badness is happening right now. And you're like, all right, you're going for this really cool moment. And then it's just like the music kicks in. Like, if you go watch that trailer, there's a couple speedboat finishes with Jamie Foo, and then it ends. Like, that's like, that is what that trailer is. So you probably don't need to watch the movie if you just watch the trailer. I feel like he was, he wasn't trying to remake Miami Vice as much as he was trying to make Miami Vice with all the beats that worked from Heat. So he's like, yeah. oh, what's the best <laughs> yeah. scene in Heat when he's driving down the road and I got that Moby remake of New Dawn Fades? So he's like, oh, yeah. I need a remake of In the Air tonight. Yeah. Let me yeah, get like a <laughs> Hooba steak or whoever they got stone sour, whatever <laughs> garbage late nineties band remade the in the air tonight. Ink yeah. For that. Yeah. It was, like it didn't work. Like everything he thought was going to work because he nailed it in heat. He tried again a decade later and for whatever reason, it just, it felt forced. I think that's what Miami vice was him trying to force it. I was thinking the Miami vice is kind of underrated. Like it's a, it's a joke of a movie to most people. Most people like think that movie is like awful. And there's some scenes in that movie that I actually like. There's parts of it that I like. Um, I've also never had any, I've never had any inclination to rewatch either that or Public Enemies. Both movies felt like when I watched them the one time, I just like never really needed to again. Public Enemies was just a sloth. Uh, that talk about too long. I, I see. I think Collateral. Uh, he put that kind of 
time constraint on him because he wanted it as a pressure cooker. He made it like a crisp, I think, 90 minutes, and, and that was it. Uh, especially, you know, he could get – he tends to get his movies a little long-winded. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, you go to Public Enemies, man, you could you could literally cut out an hour. That that film did not need to be 2, 220 or 230, whatever the runtime is. It was just – uh, people driving in cars and ha and talking really quietly, um, but but again, those antagonists. He, at least he kept the the same kind of bloodlines where you know Johnny Depp's uh, you know John Dillinger makes it a point to tell the people that he's robbing, don't worry, we're not we're not interested in your money. We're taking the bank's money. That kind of plays in with the protagonist. And McCauley said the exact same thing in Heat. Yeah, we're not here same. for the bank's money. We're here for your, we're not here for your money. We're yeah, so it's money. sure. Don't be here. I, I think. Um, it's also uh, talking about a moment in time too, you know, I, I remember watching the Oscars in 2008 and they had, the, they had the sequence at the end, you know, movies from the next year and scenes from the biggest movies, right? The ones that are going to be the biggest deal. And there was a couple scenes from public enemies in the mashup. And that's, it's a good reminder of like 10 years ago was the last time Michael Mann was like a, like a name, like, like a Michael Mann movie really was a big deal. Um, and he's a guy that likes that. You know, I've heard stories about that. Um, friend of mine, John Sheck, who was on uh, one of our shows recently, when he, he came on for the Collateral episode we did. He, he's a, you guys probably know John. He's Jonah Hex on the Legends of Tomorrow right now. And he was in, you know, that yeah. thing you do. He's the singer in the band. He's in a bunch of stuff. So mm -hmm. um, he, he went in the 90s when, like, you know, was kind of coming up. At one point got sat next to Michael Mann at an award show intentionally. It was like a publicity thing to kind of get him on, you know, Mann's radar. And, uh, you know, we talked to him a bit at the thing. And as, as his career went on, he just like what he said, he's like, if you look at his movies, it's, it's not directed by Michael Mann. It's a Michael Mann film. That's, he is that guy. Like that's the energy you get from that guy. And that is a hundred percent the way he sees it. He's an artist. He's creating art and it needs to be like, if there's a, there's a, there's an ego play for Michael Mann that is very clear. It's Even though a lot of the time he's doing adaptations, he still picks yeah. the adaptations he does very carefully. Very much so. He knows what he's working. He knows the tools he's working with too, because he lets De Niro be De Niro. He lets Pacino be Pacino. Con the same thing. Um, he also like. I was surprised to see you know Jason's favorite actor of all time. That's Daniel Day Lewis. How yeah. this was his. I'm being facetious. Uh, last mm -hmm. the, the Mohicans was his most muted role. Like I, I I watched this movie as a child, but then you know rewatching it for this, I'm like, oh god, here we go. You know, full full on Daniel Day Lewis. Uh, and then he's like super muted, you know, he's still like a, you know, a rampaging, uh, you know, American Indian, but he's not, you know, I'm drinking your milkshake, uh, Daniel Day Lewis, oh, no. which is, which is nice. So that to be able to, to kind of muzzle someone like that. Uh, and yes, it was a little bit earlier on in his career that says something that uh, of the, the clout that this man had, but, and you're right. It's like he had. An, an, an okay uprising, you know, very underrated. People didn't really watch his film in the 80s. Then he just kind of blew up in the 90s and then kind of had this decline where Michael Mann films at, at one point, like you said, just held so much water. Now it's it's kind of sad to see that kind of drift away. Yeah, after, after The Insider, I mean, if not for, like, 99 is a crazy year for movies. Um, it was a really, 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 really good year. There was, like, some of the great films of our time came out in 1999 mm -hmm. and you know, American beauty for all the, you know, for all the shrugs and uggs, we can talk about Spacey. That is one of the more classic movies of our lifetime. So there was no possible way that it was going to lose to the insider. It just wasn't going to happen. It just, the insider is a much different kind of movie. Not to mention that exact same year. I believe you were up against like boys don't cry. I think 99 was also Magnolia, which is one of my all time favorite movies. Cruise's best role. Um, the insider just kind of became this movie that people who knew about it really liked, but it wasn't, it didn't get the acclaim that it could have, right? Spotlight won best picture in 2015 or 16 or whatever it was. And this could have been a spotlight situation. As it should have though. I mean, spotlight was fantastic. Spotlight was great. I just mean that kind of movie, right? Spotlight yeah. was up against a bunch of movies that it wasn't kind of as like, crowded a field for sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, exactly. 99, you go back and it's like the matrix. There's all these movies that came out in 1999, one of the definitive years of movies ever. Yeah, you, you talk about uh, Tom Cruise. Like, I love when 
I, I'm not the. I know this is gonna hurt your heart, Ben, but you know I'm not the, <laughs> the biggest Tom Cruise fan. Um, no, I know because I am. So it's no, you can't. <laughs> I feel like I like movies despite Tom Cruise, but then I have a lot of movies I like despite Tom Cruise. So maybe I don't dislike Tom Cruise. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I like Tom Cruise when he's not playing Tom Cruise. Like Jerry Maguire is, is a little Tom Cruise. That's the cruisiest Cruise there is. But it's it's one of the best. Cruisy. But uh, Vanilla Sky, Magnolia, uh, Collateral. I like when they kind of paint Cruz out of the out of the box or out of the lines a little bit. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, and, and he was just like he just nailed the the that character so well in Collateral, where he was you know equal parts menacing, uh, uh, still like uh, very dashing. You know, I like the 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 choice of the salt and pepper hair. Why was that a choice? Who cares? It was just, it just added that kind of, it was just like, yes, it's Tom Cruise, but he kind of looks different and he's acting different too. Um, and, and then Jamie Foxx also before collateral, you know, this was, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, this was before Jamie Foxx kind of blew up with, you know, uh, Ray and, and Django and, and has be, you know, cause at a time Jamie Foxx was just kind of thrown into these kind of weird comedic roles, kind of like in the, well, in he started out in comedy and he sort of had like, he tapered off. He started a hundred percent comedy, like in living color. Yep. And yeah, then the, he sort of just, he ended up doing serious stuff later, almost the, exclusively. The nineties was, yeah, it was largely comedy and he's in a bunch of comedies in the nineties. And then, and then he's in, he's a big role in any given Sunday, which is kind of, you know, that's, that's a, that's attempting the breakthrough. And then in Oh one, he's in Ali, I believe is his, um, yeah, the, the corner man. He's his corner man. And he's really good in that. That's like, that's like the kind of the role that a lot of people look back on and they remember like thinking that, you know, Jamie Foxx was like arguably the best part of the movie and then he starts to break through. It's actually Ray is the same year as Collateral. So believe it or not, or so, yeah, Ray, he got two Oscar noms. He got a supporting and a lead the same year. Um, one for Collateral, one for Ray. So that's the big breakthrough here for Jamie Foxx, like through and through, no question. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, that happens. It, they just get, they, they need the time to shine, right? It was like Jim Carrey kind of, you know, came from the same, literally the same show. Yep. Uh, and, and once you, hand these kind of you know comedic actors their their chance and their opportunity some some take it and run with it and i and like you said it took uh, jamie fox a couple times for people to really take him seriously because he was such a slapstick over the top actor but now it's like everything he's in he's he's complete leading man oscar winning material um and, and this was a very muted role in collateral for him he was you know they didn't give him a ton to do because Tom Cruise was just such a, a big presence, such a menacing presence of the film. So I, I think that was a perfect kind of marriage uh, on, on how they, they group those two together in that film. Well, Cruise was less of a character than he was a force in that movie. Sure. Basically, Jamie Foxx's character spent the whole movie growing and like learning to assert himself and, you know, stop living in his own head and take action. So I feel like it, he had to be sort of muted because he was sort of you have to be a more neutral character for the audience to really see themselves in that role. Whereas Tom Cruise is just sort of a force of nature that changes entire life. And, you know, a, a few hours. He's Cruise is really, really good in collateral. And if you, you go back and you try to like separate out his, both his best movies and his best performances, it's one of the few times he allowed himself to play a character like that. He didn't, it's the end of the cruise run when he's out for an Oscar that he stopped after, you know, he did, he followed that's Oh four. He follows that up in Oh five with war of the worlds and then in Oh six with mission impossible three. And that's when all the Oprah stuff happened. And he came back in the late, not uh, like the, like, like Oh nine and the movies he started making, you know, Oh eight, he makes Valkyrie and he makes lions for lambs and he makes like, you know, he makes some pretty bad movies in there. He makes Oblivion a few years later, right? He's in Night and Day. He's like, the choices that he's taking are mostly just like big sci-fi and big action. Paychecks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not even paychecks because Cruz can make any movie that he wants, right? Like, even sure. at that point, he's the arguably the definitive movie star of, of our lifetime, right? Maybe ever. Like, there's almost nobody who's ever done it. Like, four decades of this is crazy. But I guess my point is that in the late 80s into the 90s, you know, he's in, he's playing born of the 4th of July, right? He's willing to take Magnolia. He's taking eyes wide shut. He's taking collateral. Like the kind of, the kind of role that he was willing to put himself in was much more adventurous, 
he didn't mind being kind of a villain. He didn't mind being a little more like vulnerable and weird and creepy. Um, you know, it's, it's the later part of his career that he's really kind of straight away from it. And collateral is the last one, the last movie that he took that he really went for a home run and he, he, he hits one. It's a shame that he didn't get recognized for that role more on a, on a critical level. Cause looking back on it, it's pretty damn good. I'd argue that he sort of took Jack Reacher, which he was probably the worst person on the planet to cast for that movie. Yeah. Like, and he made it his own to the point where Jack Reacher, I mean, never go back sucked, but the first one was it's kind of sweet. really, it was a good movie despite Lee Childs being like, no, get anybody else. We want to do a Jack Reacher TV show just to not have Tom Cruise in it. I like literally heard him say, that. you guys read that headline the other day when he was talking about Cruise was too short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I read that and I was like, hey, Lee Childs, guess what? The entire world book franchise star took it and made it better than it was. That's the yeah. reason. Otherwise, no one would ever care and you wouldn't get a TV show made. That's yeah. the reason. It's because Tom Cruise decided to make your movie. And if you didn't make it, no one would care. No one would have made it. You should be kissing his ass. Yeah, for exactly. sure. You're getting a TV show because Tom Cruise made two Jack Reacher movies. We need and a like, tall blonde guy. Cool. Then get Neil McDonough. He's not doing anything right now. And just shut <laughs> up. Like <laughs> Exactly. I couldn't I couldn't believe like that, that comment. I was like the air goes <laughs> this guy. Uh, Cruise is small. Uh, oh. I almost I almost ran over him with a chafing dish when I worked at Caesar's Palace. Unfortunately, really? uh, I almost hit him. He was walking next to uh, Sly, and they are both very tiny people. Yeah, uh, shockingly. Uh, if I didn't, if so, Sylvester Stallone wasn't wearing a bright purple suit, I might have hit him with my my giant uh, catering box. But thank God he was. So. I'm yet to be. I'm yet to be in the same um, cruise. I, I still haven't had like an awards show or anything where he has been present. Um, whereas Sly, I got to spend about an hour with last year um, or the year before. I can't remember which it was now on my birthday, um, and got to have dinner with him and, and hear him tell stories. And it was it was amazing. And he he's short, but he's like he's a big dude. You know, carries yeah. his, he carries his personality with a lot of a lot of size. He's more wide. Uh, yeah. Cruz is just a tiny man. Yeah. <laughs> when we do this show and we kind of really get into the actual person that is making these movies, sometimes it turns out really well. Like, like in the case of Bigelow, like last episode, I think you and I both could agree that we tend to like her and are excited more about her films from digging deep into the actual person where on the other side of that, our boy Refn, that just, Ooh. man, we can't stop. Uh, Refn sucks, right? Like as, <laughs> as an actual person, He's just not that that bright. He makes beautiful films, but accidentally, it, accidentally, and it made us kind of like him a little bit less, and, and the and the things that he produces a little bit less. How did you feel, kind of meeting and going toe to toe with one of your he, man was already one of your favorites? So ha, has your opinion changed of him at all by doing more research about him? I tip my hand about this a little bit because I couldn't really keep it in. I feel like there's a lot I like about man tonally that I wondered if it was an accident. I'm like, yeah, did that blurry effect is really nice. And it really puts the, the lead in better focus with the background being all blurred out like that. I wonder if that's intentional. And sure enough, you find out every lens, every shot, every film choice, you know, every camera selection is j it's meticulously detailed everything that happens is on purpose and everything he can control he does and just the more i found out about how how everything i liked was a choice he made uh as as opposed to an accident made me feel really good about you know about him as a director you know there there he, there's so much he does that he doesn't even talk about because it's just you know that's how the sausage gets made but just knowing that he had a hand in it, and that was a, a conscious decision he made. Made me like him more as a director, you know, as opposed to someone like Reffin, who's like, "Oh, that was a good effect." He's like, "Oh, I didn't realize that was an accident." It's just kind of disappointing. <laughs> so I, I actually, I, I found myself liking him more as a director the the more research I did. So that was gratifying. Did did his movies kind of hold up? To because you already held them in such high esteem, but just kind of doing this, did a lot of them hold up? Uh, well. The, the movies held up fine. The stuff I didn't like, I didn't like. And the stuff I liked, I still liked. But he, there was this uh, one lucky thing that happened, which is basically L.A. Takedown not getting picked up as a series. Because he has... there are He, for one of the reasons it's so bloated, is because there are so many characters. He wanted to really explore all those characters. He you know had a real rich universe in mind. 
And I think the best thing that happened to him was that LA takedown not getting picked up for a TV series. Cause I don't know how well it would have done versus, you know, him just making maybe a little bit of an overlong, but a fantastic movie that, you know, is going to stand up forever. I, I think that was a, a better use of that material. And if he makes a prequel to it, great. I'll go see it in the theaters, you know? So, um, that seems like the only thing that was an accident, but still he, you know, he was prepared. He wrote all that material. He had all of it ready. And instead of being like scrapping the project and being like, ah, we'll never do that again. He's like, well, I'll just make a, a good movie out of this. And I think that was a, a good choice also. It's also interesting too. When you go back to heat, something when we did it on my show, I think that was episode 100 of action movie and anime. We covered heat and we, you know, we always watch the trailer and we react to the trailer, right? And and the trailer for Heat is interesting because it's it is directly advertising that it's the first time Pacino and De Niro are on screen. It's not like a trailer today. It literally is like dramatic sweeping shot. It's like two titans of their generation together for the first time. And Selling you know, the actors, not the actual yeah, story. That, yeah, yeah. That was the big sell of the movie. It was Pacino and De Niro versus each other, and it was the actors, not the characters. And I think it was all the buzz back then, man. I, even as a you know younger kid, like I remember, everyone was talking about that was like a Super Bowl event. It was like Tyson versus deal. whoever. It was nuts. Yeah, completely, completely. My parents made me stay home and watch my brother so they could go see it. That's pretty cool. Good parents, because I was twelve. <laughs> so. That was my heat experience. I didn't get to see it till much later, but my dad came home and he was really clearly jacked. You know, he was really excited about it. It was late at night, but he was like, he could have let me go to sleep, but he had to come into my room and tell me about the movie. So <laughs> I remember I, seeing I think heat that, first time in high school. And I remember, you know, seeing it and co I couldn't really believe that this was like a movie that existed that I hadn't seen yet. Cause it was like, seemed like it was the coolest thing that had ever happened. I remember I like, after I watched, I rewound and watched the, the gunfight again. And then I remember I took the DVD to school the next day with my computer. And this girl I had a crush on made her watch the gunfight. So I thought it was so cool. Um, <laughs> you know, and she's like, okay, Ben, sure. <laughs> I just remember it was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And like, he, he, and there's like, you know, there's tropes in that movie, uh, you know, of characters that I remember at the time thing really cool. And you realize as you get older, like that they, that they're, they're not like, okay. Like great, great examples. You know, when, when, when Neil sees um, Ashley Judd cheating on, on that, she's like, no one, not no one Neil. And he's like, after he talks to her, he's like, you will give Chris another chance. Then he's like, clean up, go home. Clean up, go home. And you're like, he's this like really aggressive, borderline abusive male character who's like asserting himself into the life of like a much smaller woman that like he really has no business controlling. And he's like, like borderline abusive. It's like when you watch it again, you're like, this is really cool when you're 15. And then when you're older, you realize that's just kind of gross. But he's like <laughs> this thief character, right? So like you grow to learn and understand and you're like, okay, but he's a movie character. You're not supposed to aspire to be every movie character you like. You can just be affected by them. And I remember thinking that when I watched it recently, like I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen when I was 15. Well, the thing, just, think about the dialogue in, in Thief. Like you couldn't make that movie today. I mean, they say some words in that film that would make Tarantino blush. It was like, wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and even even that, like that's the, you know, you're supposed to be rooting for De Niro and he's this kind of complete asshole. Uh, he's kind of this chauvinist uh in, until he finds his his special girl and all that, and that kind of mellows him out. But yeah, a lot of you know, man films are kind of man films, pun, in much so. pun intended. But there is enough in there to to make a you know your 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 significant other uh, that might not be interested in, in those kind of guy flicks interested in it. Um, yeah. The the guy shoots uh and I, I told this to jason off the air a guy shoot uh, you know man shoots sex scenes like ratner shoots uh action which is just <laughs> awful i mean it might as well be the room when when michael mann is shooting a sex scene because everyone is fully clothed and people are humping things that don't make sense mathematically so i don't i don't get that even even yeah. though you know there is some sleaze to to his movies he just doesn't outwardly do sexuality well he, he's kind of awkward with it uh it's I, like I think it's a choice because I think every time someone gets involved with a woman, they stop being careful. It it upends their whole worldview. Yeah. Like every every meticulous character is meticulous until they meet somebody, and then you know it, it screws them up. So I think the sex scenes are sort of like it, it's showing how much tumult it's throwing their life into. And I could be reading too much into that. 
So very, I mean, it's a very male point of view. His point of view with with these characters, like that's very, very much so. That they're you're, they're careful and like living their life until you know they get distracted by something that they can't control as much. I love that scene in Thief when he's like yelling at the girl and she's like she finds out who he is and he's like, what's he say? He's like, I wear silk shirts. I wear hundred dollar slacks or whatever in the car. Yeah, yeah. It was like nineteen eighties prices. Like these eight dollar shoes. Yeah, these, these, these <laughs> pants were hundred dollars. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, it's 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 almost the same exact scene in Public Enemies too. When she's just like, you know, he's John Dillinger's asking the girl what she does, and she has to kind of divulge all the information, and then he just she asks him so much, he gets annoyed and just like, yeah, Rob Banks for a living. What what? Yeah. I, I wear this coat. I wear blah blah. blah. I was just like, oh god, it's. The same scene, but which is not, funny. It's like good. the first time any dude meets a female character is like, "Oh yeah, I'm a thief." The first time they meet, it's it's kind of interesting. That's a yeah. bold choice, Cotton. Well, except for <laughs> except for uh, except for Neil, you know, he's a salesman. Sure. Yeah. 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 You know, he's a salesman. Yeah. Well, I guess in Thief, he'd met her a few times before they'd established that they knew each other. Yeah. You guys have a favorite man scene? Oh man. Uh. Huh, um. Man, that the diner scene's hard hard to beat. Uh, there's one, yeah. there's some scenes in uh, in Manhunter that are just so goddamn stylistic that are just so incredible. Yeah. Um, God, Manhunter just holds up. But a lot of the films don't hold up uh, because, like you said, they're they're calling each other on pay phones, and it, it's very. He makes films very of the time that he's making them in. Uh, so they seem a little alien to you know maybe a millennial that's that's watching. A, yeah. a man film. They're just like, what? What is he doing? Where? Where are these phones? You know. But uh, yeah, there, there's a, there was a lot that that stuck out. Of course, none that a, a lot of the the back and forth. I like how they did the interview scene in um, the Insider, yeah. um, where they just kind of cut it together and, and uh, Pacino kind of editing it. Uh, that that was good. The, the the newsroom scene when they're all just kind of arguing. Yeah. And, he, and Pacino realizing that no one's on his side is just heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man, he does scenes, man. He does scenes well. Jay? Uh, well, I, I think a scene from Heat, everybody talks about the diner scene, but that really wasn't the first face-to-face. -face. The first face-to-face -face is when Neil's breaking into that uh, building with um, yeah, with, with, with Val Kilmer's character, and he goes outside to just look around, and he, like something feels off to him. Yeah. And everybody in that container is holding their breath, and the dude makes the little bit of a noise leaning up against it, and it, he yeah. looks... And it shows it's the, face, and it's like, yeah, that's kind of the first time they're face to face. That tension where no one's making a noise, and you know, you're not even sure if the sound on your TV is working. And right, and, Pacino and, walks it, in and he's like, and he's like, we walk. He's like, we I'm walk. Right there. We walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's sweet. And the, he, the, he knew he couldn't nab him. They, they, he knew they were about to take down a score, but they couldn't move on him, or they, they would have to let him go. You know, for what breaking and entering, he's gonna walk in six months or whatever. Bullshit they... B and E gets kicked down to a misdemeanor. You know, yeah, that's yeah. a great scene. I agree. I love that. I love. I love the procedural nature of the way his thought process works. All of it, really cool. The so very I, end I, scene in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jay. No, I wasn't gonna add anything. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I just uh, like talking. Just like talking about film. Uh, the very end scene. I was gonna say in Heat is very underrated too. I think that is. Yeah just should be, should be probably does get taught in film school uh it's all practical they're using the lights from the airplanes uh you know man himself said he just wanted to shoot somewhere where seems like an everyday place but is very alien because that's not typically where humans are um and so you have these kind of almost sci-fi looking little, you know, bunkers where they're just kind of going in and out of and, and taking cover. And then with the constant, you know, talk about tension. That's the, that's tension in a nutshell for anyone that's interested in film, watching film, making film. That's how you shoot a tension filled scene. I was going to bring that scene up. I mean, I think, you know, for me to answer the same question, that scene is incredible. The score that is setting in, which is by Moby, it's called God Moving Over the Face of the Waters, I believe is the name of the song. And it's incredible. It's this big synth score. And it's, you know, I remember the first time watching Heat, right? I told you I was never going back. Um, that's, I mean, that's a pretty impactful final scene in a movie, I have to say. Like, uh, so that scene's incredible. You know, I do have to say that I think, I mentioned it a few times, but the, the bank robbery and shootout, 
there's moments in that sequence that I just will always remember having seen the first time. Like when the, when the bus moves and you see Val Kilmer's face drop from a smile to just gun up and it's just rock and roll. I love that. Um, you know, I really am a huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of that courtroom scene, the insider. I, I think that's like such a, well, just one of those moments, one of those build up scenes where you, you're so on the side of our guys at this, at that point in the movie. Um, and Bruce McGill kills it. And then I think, you know, in collateral, yo homie, is that my briefcase? It's another one that I can remember watching in the theater when it happened being like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like that is the, like the, you know, and, and you know that the precision with which he shoots the guys is, is, is military. It's man. He knows it. You know, it's the double, double tap entry wound of the sternum, one in the head. He goes and he finishes it off as he's walking past the guy. He doesn't even look and he shoots him. Um, well, gun guys have broken that down and they, you know, they're really impressed with it too. How he, they call it firing from retention where he, he uses his left hand to knock the guy's gun across his body, but he yeah. pulls his left hand back. So it's not in his path of fire. And he fires from his right hip as he's drawing his gun out, which is probably took a lot of practice for Tom Cruise to pull off moving both your hands like that. And it, it just looks so practiced and smooth. You can like I'm not, I'm not like a, a super gun guy like that, but I've watched some YouTube videos of people who are into that. And, uh, yeah. They were real impressed with the with how that was choreographed. There's behind the scenes of Cruz gun training and choreography fight training in that movie that are pretty impressive because um, he did put the time in for that. And he's a master when it comes to that stuff. You can see that behind the scenes. There's a behind the scenes shot of The Last Samurai when he, when he takes on like those five guys at the end. And it's he's doing it all in one sequence and it's all done like real speed. Um, mm -hmm. You can watch it B-roll with him doing it. And it's pretty, pretty freaking impressive. Same kind of thing, though, where he does that. And... Uh, I've also heard that the the shootout in heat, the way that they work up towards the line of cars is away as opposed to away from it, uh, is shown in like it's shown in military classes of how to properly reload. Hmm. Like it's a real they've like it's like that's taught. Like that movie is taught. Well, the uh, yeah the 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 cover and fire way they move um, behind cover is that's uh, yeah that's again I don't know that kind of stuff, but gun guys have broken that down and said that was you know pretty accurate too i don't know exactly. if he's got like a guy who who advises him on that kind of stuff but he, he definitely knows his way around big sets too like there's a lot of giant like the siege uh scenes in last of the mohicans uh he does he just shoots very well Th that's something to be said where everything felt very tactile he, he's just much better of a tactile type of director big scenes big sets than relying more on, on CG and whatever. But uh, we're kind of up against it on time. That's pretty much uh, our show on Michael Mann. Uh, this has been a blast as it always is. Uh, I'm glad that we could review uh, a director that's both of your, at least at one point, if not your favorite directors now. Top five. Top yeah. five? Still? Yeah. Nice. Nice. I'm I still love Ben. His great, his great <laughs> films are still so great. I, I at one point recently did a top 50. I took my, I actually organized and ranked my 50 favorite films. Um, and then my computer that it was written on got stolen. So I have to try to do it off memory, but I'm pretty certain that heat is like number six or seven. It's like, it's a top 10 movie for me. And the insider is like in the top 25. So, you know, two of my top 50 are directed by this guy. I can't really say much about him other than like it's pretty, it's pretty real deal. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. And, and for most of the movie, I would say 70% of the movies that I've watched for the first time just this last two weeks in prep for this, I was extremely pleasantly surprised and, and very happy that we picked him. Uh, but yeah, on to the next one. Uh, but let's kind of go around the table. Ben, uh, Ben Bateman, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Where can everyone find you? Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you guys can find me at Ben Bateman Media, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I've got a brand new show on Collider Podcast Network called The Action Guys, which is cool. The action Movie Anatomy on, on the Popcorn Talk Network every week. You know, I do some Magic Card stuff, too. Um, you can find it on my Twitter. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for thank you so much for, for having me on the show, guys. This was, this was a lot of fun. I'm glad we got to talk about Michael Mann. Absolutely. Mr. Jason E. Alt, where can everyone find you? Uh, Twitter, Jason E. Alt. That's probably the best place to find me. I also do some magic card stuff, um, a little bit of writing, a little bit of everything. So, yeah, just check me out on Twitter. Perfect. Uh, you can find me right here, John Dunning, on this very YouTube channel. They said, we said, also doing some magic card stuff. I will be, uh, the, the next one coming out is my interview on the High Mind with Benny Smith. Can't wait for that one. Uh, but yeah, I also love talking film and all that. Twitter, at Orzov Dunn, also on Reddit at the same. So until next time, movie fans, we'll see you later.
See you guys.